All right, well, let's get in your Bible this morning. Go to Luke chapter 19. And we're going to start today in verse 28, but I need you to do a couple of things. The first one's bear with me, because having just gotten whooped by a six-year-old, I'm trying to get uh, my head back on straight. <laughs> just when you start to get proud of yourself, thinking you're pretty good on-the-fly extemporaneous speaker, Aren't gnomes a symbol of evil anyways? Okay. Well, I'm joining that camp. <laughs> no, they're not, but that one got me stumped. Okay. So this morning, departing from Pastor's journey down to Revelation, want to look at the significance of transition. We can probably, any of us, even, even our young ones, can probably mark different spots in our lives where we've been easily able to measure a transition, a change in direction, um, or a significant addition to whatever it is that we're going through in our lives. Today's Palm Sunday, and is the beginning of what many call Holy Week. Historically, this marks the events that occurred up to the moment of Jesus' death on the cross and, the, and His resurrection the following Sunday. While nothing can ever be seen as more important than the sacrifice of our Savior and His defeat of death. The serious thing that cannot be ignored is... Palm Sunday marks the beginning of that transition from His ministry on the earth. It's important for us, I believe, to recognize this moment as a pivotal moment or a transitional moment because ministry does not and has not stopped. It did not cease and end with Jesus. Jesus. But the responsibility for conducting and carrying out ministry shifted. It transitioned from Jesus onto each and every one of us. And so the impactful point for me is that as we dive into Scripture this morning and look at this triumphal entry, Jesus' journey back into the city, the beginning of that transition, let that resonate Uh, it, let that resonate with you, or at least consider the thought as this being the beginning of transition. But first, this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, this morning we just come humbled, just floored and in awe of who you are and what you've accomplished. And Lord, though the time on the calendar tells us that this is the time when we're supposed to reverently honor the sacrifice that you made. Lord, I, my, my hope is that, that we would consider your actions and not only revere them, Lord, but be empowered and motivated to carry out the work that you called us to do. Lord, this morning I just pray that it be your words that are spoken and not mine. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke 19, beginning at verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went, and found it, just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. 
They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And he went along. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones would cry out. Now a couple of things I'd like you to do in that passage. is to make a mark at verse 40. But then I also would like you to go back to verse 30 and put yourself in the mindset of Jesus' disciples who've been told, hey, go down to this village, find this colt, untie it. If anybody asks what you're doing, you just tell them the Lord needs it and take off. Okay, now let's come forward to 2023. Let's imagine ourselves at the Lee's family farmstead north of Moreland. <laughs> yeah, 2024 be fine. Um, <laughs> I told you that gnome got me jacked up. <laughs> but let's imagine ourselves traveling along on foot and going by the Lee family farm north of Moreland, Kansas, and seeing a colt tied there. And imagine their reaction to having somebody walk up, untie it. Oh, well, the Lord needs it. <laughs> I think maybe someone who wears clothes like I do every day might be getting a phone call <laughs> if, that, if, if that occurred. I can't help but giggle at, at how this, this occurs. There's no resistance shown to them taking this cult in any of the four accounts. I just find that kind of, kind of funny. Verse 40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. At the beginning of this moment, Jesus has already shown his disciples who he is, and they are proclaiming him. But the truth about Jesus, the truth about God and who God is, is it cannot be denied. No matter how hard we try to hide it, to move him out of the way, to make him irrelevant, we cannot take away the fact that he is the creator, that he is the beginning and the end, that we are here because of him. And even inanimate objects would cry out if we didn't. That's got to resonate within the hearts of believers. Uh, and it, I just I can't see how it does. Prior to this event, Jesus had spent a great deal of time showing people who he was and working hard to explain it at the same time. People were healed. Countless of people were healed. People came to him to be healed. He didn't just seek them out. They came to him. Sermons were preached. Disciples were trained. These events did not occur simply to stop after Jesus was crucified. What would be the point of that? Why do it? What could possibly... What good could possibly come from teaching and showing men how to care for each other in a manner pleasing to God only for those acts to cease upon his death? School teachers, you spend the entire year showing your kids how to write effectively and appropriately, how to develop life skills for the future. What would be the point of that if on the last day of school it was all just thrown out the window and abandoned and never... What would be the point? What would be the benefit? What are you developing at that point? Read a text message thread of some grown adults, and I kind of help, can't help but wonder if that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> but, but what would what would be the point? Where's what? What's the value of the investment if all of it ends once Jesus dies? What Luke does show us in the same passage is a glimpse of what is in Jesus' mind that very day. The first is a deep sadness. Look at verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem 
and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when you will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Here we see an expression of sorrow, of lament, possibly even of frustration. Jesus is looking upon the city of his ancestors, of his chosen people, of the very people that were about to hand him over for torture, simply because they do not see Jesus for who he truly is. He's also lamenting about what will happen to the nation of Israel. When I read this passage, I think of the time of the Crusades, well after Roman occupation. I think of how Islamic states destroyed and then reoccupied the city. And I also think about those Christian nations that worked so hard to take it back, but not to deliver it to the Jewish people, to keep it for themselves. In a sense, that nation was gone. In the very next passage, we also see frustration and anger that's expressed by Jesus. Verse 45. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It's written, he said to him, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they couldn't find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. We've seen Jesus at a point of transition from lament and of sorrow and of frustration to now one potentially of, of anger, of here's the work that I've been doing for the last three years, knowing full well what he's getting ready to do and walks into the temple and sees what it is that's occurring. That's got to be incredibly frustrating. Got to be incredibly frustrating. Another key point that exists here is that as much as Jesus himself dreaded what, what was to come, as much as Jewish leaders desired to have him removed, verses 47 and 48 show their clear inability to stop God's will from happening. The Jewish leaders, I mean. No matter how hard they tried, it wasn't going to occur until the time that God called for it. My greater point this morning is that this week marks the beginning of transition from Jesus' ministry to his disciples who he trained in person to us who have reaped the benefits of those disciples' work and the ultimate gift that Jesus gave us. It is a week's long worth of events and an ultimate triumph that says, I have shown you the way, now it's your turn to go do it. And we know it's our responsibility. How do we know that it's our responsibility? Come on, that's too easy. Take the bait. Matthew, <laughs> thank you. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus himself told us this. Jesus himself told us this. Go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and teaching them all that I have taught you. And know that I'll be with you all. So it's a point of transition, but it's one that's an obvious point of transition because we're directed to do so. It's easy this week to get caught up into the passion of what has occurred. It's, it's very easy. Even for someone like me who runs away from emotion, it is easy to get caught up into reflecting on what Jesus put himself through for each and every one of us. But then what happens after that? 
What do we do with it after that? I mean, do we just get ready for Memorial Day? I mean, <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's more than a calendar here that's, that's, that's impactful and that's important. And while it's critical that we reflect on what Jesus did at the appropriate times, we've got to be motivated to act. We have to be willing to do more than simply reflect on what it is that occurred. We've got to be in a position to take on the torch in transition from one generation to the next, to continue to share the good news of the gospel, to continue to share what it is that Jesus did. We can't honor him in any better fashion than that, than that is to share the gospel. It's one of the things that's kind of exciting about today. I made the comment last night to the kids, hey, we've got a whole lot of church tomorrow. But <laughs> look at how we're ending it. We're ending it today with a baptism. We're ending it today with someone publicly and symbolically declaring that he has given his life to Jesus and has chosen to follow. What better way to put an exclamation point on this argument related to transition than that? As we also typically celebrate this week, we look at the Lord's Supper. And I need you to move over to Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are taught to observe the Lord's Supper in a manner that reflects remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice for us. There are two things that need to occur. The first is that we have to approach it in a worthy manner. The second is, I believe, an effective part of that remembrance is remaining motivated to our purpose, to our calling as believers. First, is in approaching it in a worthy manner. At verse 27, Paul writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. We can't take the Lord's Supper and minimize it. We can't over-dramatize over it either. It has a purpose. We're called to be of the appropriate mindset when we do that. This morning, before we go down the rest of the road of the Lord's Supper, what I want to do is just take a few moments, just as ourselves, just right in the pews, right where we're at, and consider our hearts and consider our mindset. We know that we're sinners. We know that Jesus died for us. We know that He paid the price for our sins. And we know that we've been called not only to follow Him, but to share His, to share his word. When we take a step of acting to remember Him, our heart and our mind has to be in the right place. If we're lost in our own world, if we've been distracted by 20 little wooden gnomes, and our, and our mind's not in the right spot, we're taking away from the point of what it is that Jesus asks us to do. So what I want to do is just ask each of you to just take a few moments right where you're at and just work 
to make sure that your mind and your heart are in the right place before we honor God this morning. Father God, this morning as we uh, prepare to honor you and your sacrifice, Lord, I just pray that you would still our hearts, that you would put within our minds the appropriate perspective, that of giving full consideration to all that you did for each and every one of us. Lord, I just pray that this morning that if we're struggling with one worldly item or another that you would cause us to cast those aside, to focus solely on you, to honor the transition from when you handed the torch over to us to be able to carry out your good news. Lord, as we consider this ultimate sacrifice this morning and as we choose to honor you, I just pray that you bless this time of us. In your name, amen. Can I get a couple of men to step forward, please? Go ahead and deliver the bread. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread 
and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you. You know, the night that that occurred, Jesus was handed over. And from that point, he was mocked. He was beaten. He was broken. And eventually, he was crucified. We talked in Sunday school this morning about how the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, has been designed to show us that the plan all along was for Jesus. And as we reflect on pivotal moments, such as what history shows us occurs this week, we also have to reflect on that transition of responsibility. It is unfathomable to continually ponder what Jesus put himself through for us. What Jesus put himself through for me. I'm not someone who can emotionally handle constantly dwelling on that. But he didn't ask me to do that. He asked me to accept it. And he asked me to go share the good news. He asked me to go share what he's done for me. He asked me to go share the fact that he took Cole Presley a wretch and redeemed him through that sacrifice. And that's possible for each and every man and woman walking on the earth. If we will but take up that mantle and accept that transition and take on the responsibility of that ministry. As we carry out solemn ceremonies such as the Lord's Supper, we should be of a mindset of sorrow because we are the reason that Jesus went through that. But there should also be just a little bit of passion there because of what it is that he's asked us to do. Those can feel like opposing thoughts sometimes. But you know what? When we've got the Spirit in our heart, it really makes sense. It really makes sense. I'm going to close there to keep from babbling on. But I will ask this this morning. All the time in the world can be dedicated to learning what it is that Jesus did for us. But what do we do with that knowledge? But, but what do we do with it? We can make sure that every year on the calendar we honor thank you, that we honor Jesus' sacrifice when the calendar says we're supposed to. But what do we do with it after? What are we doing with it afterwards? Are we staying motivated? Are we staying purposely focused on what it is that God has called us to do? That, in my opinion, is where our hearts and our minds should be this week as we reflect on what it is that Jesus did. Because you know what? Next week, we get to celebrate that glorious day that He defeated death. Next week, we get to celebrate that moment that he declared victory over sin. Shouldn't be any sorrowful faces that day. Shouldn't be any of that. Mitchell, you got a song queued up and ready to go? Let's do it, Dennis.